We're hot. Woohoo! Ted says we're hot. All right, that didn't get everybody excited. Uh, it's a pretty dead crowd, guys. It's going to be a tough one. Um, so uh, uh, this is our last uh, um, uh, one-track mind talk before uh, the keynote. Uh, so no pressure, first of all. Um, uh, t Tommy Peter from RIT, uh, which is I love RIT. I love going up there. Uh, I love buying. Uh, uh, I, I love buying plates for everybody. Uh, last time I went up, I just opened an invitation. Anyone, anyone been to Rochester had a garbage plate? For those uninitiated, it is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it is a collection of food on a plate uh, that has no earthly place together except in a garbage can. And in Rochester, they sell it. Uh, so it's like potato salad, macaroni salad, uh, some kind of meat, a red hot, a white hot. If you're not from upstate New York, you probably don't know the difference. Um, there's a burger patty sometimes involved. There's a, a, a meat sauce thing. It's like sloppy Joe mix, but not. It's kind of weird. It's a mustard um, and like hash browns, right? Basically, give or take, depending on how you order. You can order any way you want. Ketchup, mustard, oh, the whole deal. All on one plate, piled up. If you're one of those people that your food can't touch, you can't go to Rochester, right? Like, that's just not, that's just not allowed. Anyway, um, what? <laughs> chicken and fries, yeah, or you can go the simple route. So uh, this talk um, uh, was kind of a quandary, I think, for the, the program committee this year. Are we, we good? We're good. Uh, because, I mean, there is sensitivity around, particularly in this industry, um, a culture of alcohol and having to drink in order to be here and whatever. And that's something we, we've never really, I mean, as much as we have a party on Saturday night, um, I mean, it's as many sodas as you can drink, too. And we try to be um, uh, kind of as inclusive and open and not, I, I personally don't think that alcohol needs to be a part of an event like this and to, to have fun. I mean, if you want to drink, that's great. but. Whatever. Anyway, so there's some sensitivities when you have a talk about like, hey, can you get hammered and authenticate? Uh, and so the, that's what the talk title reads like. And there was some initial like apprehension about, oh my God, we're not going to talk about getting loaded and, and uh, basically make it be a big talk about drinking. And it turns out it's not. Like these guys are legitimate researchers uh, exploring the space. Of, um, I like how all your friends laughed at you when I called you legitimate researchers. <laughs> Wow, that's a hell of an endorsement. You, you could transfer to U of R still. So, that was like an Army Navy joke, by the way, for those of you that don't live in Rochester. Uh, anyway, so this is, I think it's actually fascinating research. So, we're happy to have you guys on the stage. So, without further ado, this is where you clap for Tommy and Peter. You can take it off if you want. I just look like that because it's a badass thing to do. Hello. Whoa. Uh, what's going on? Oh, anyways. So, good evening and welcome to the last installment here going on with my topic, or our topic, can a drunk person authenticate using brain waves? Clicker. So, to start off the talk, I can present myself because, yeah, I'm from RIT. Woo, right? <laughs> so, in reality, I'm a security researcher at Grimm. Ooh, Grimm. Sponsor, right? Yeah. You want to talk to me? Buy me a drink. Come on, please. Double whiskey sour. What? Can you pay for it? Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's my first time talking at ShmooCon here, so, uh, whoo, right? And uh, the pass off here, here's. All right. So, hi, everyone. I'm Peter Muller. This is my first time being at ShmooCon. Um, so, if you want to get to know about me, follow my Twitter at TallPeter with a trailing underscore. Um, I like to talk about assembly language and machine learning, so if you have any interest in that, come find me afterwards. Um, came here from Seattle to talk to you today, and I'm looking forward to it. So, a lot of times when I give a presentation, I like to put a TLDR in the beginning because, you know, a lot of slides, right? So, I've got a nice summary going on here. So, this research that uh, Bruce introduced is uh, us using a medical device, an EEG, to study an impaired user's brain waves. And uh, we evaluate those metrics as a way to authenticate them to a computing system. So our research uses uh, machine learning techniques, and uh, we evaluate our approach using both uh, pre-collected data sets from UC Irvine 
and uh, live subjects, right? Always interesting. So our experiments use, uh, of course, number of drinks, drinks, drinks all day, right? And uh, breathalyzers. Disclaimer, because you know we're in infosec and there's red tape somewhere. First disclaimer, no subjects were harmed during these test trials. Well, I don't know if they're harmed, but they tell me they're not, right? Number two, these are uh, preliminary results. So it's still a work in progress, but it's interesting enough to uh, tell you guys all. Last thing, there's no math in this presentation, so. <laughs> because, you know, I'm not gonna bore you guys to death, and uh, if you want math, ask him or me, it doesn't matter. I got a degree in this crap, but it doesn't matter in that either. <laughs> All right, so we talked about an EEG, but what is that? So EEG stands for electroencephalogram, a word that Tommy cannot say. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a biometric device. Uh, electroencephalogram, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so an EEG is a biometric device that allows you to collect data on the brain. So if you look at this picture of a really cute baby, um, it has probes all over its head. So each one of these probes represents a different channel or a different cognitive function that we can view on the brain. So all of these are sensors that are collecting uh, changes in voltage in microvolts, so very tiny measurement. And <laughs> but at the end, the raccoon was so like strangled, it became uh, incapacitated from like the chokehold, and the drunk guy was like, "Oh, car started, whatever," and throws it in the passenger seat. So going with the story, guy's like, sweet, car's on, and drives away with the raccoon. And while driving with this uh, raccoon, uh, raccoon wakes up from being incapacitated and attacks the dude. End result, guy got attacked, quote unquote, rams through a fence and lands into a swimming pool. And this is where it all begins. Save the raccoons, right? So. In reality, so I was like, when I heard this story, I was like, you know, there gotta be a better solution than using a breathalyzer lock for a car, right? And uh, I did a lot of search, and I remember a while back that like, Berkeley did a EEG authing thing, but they didn't do so well, and it wasn't for impaired users. So I was kinda like, can I do something better? Absolutely, right, hopefully, I don't know. If not, then this is a failed presentation. So, Doing this research, months later, I found out that the news reporting agency, CBS, reported as fake news, and they corrected themselves. I was quite sad. So, but the thing was, I thought this idea was still pretty like innovative in some degree, so I was like, let's keep growing, uh, rolling with this, let's keep doing this. So, I was like, okay, I need to get an EEG. What can I do? So I did a lot of like Google Foo or DuckDuckGo or whatever I use, right? And uh, I found three choices. Choice one was like to do a uh, DIY, build your own. And I was like, no way, there's too much work there. And it's like breadboard this, wire that, solder this. Nope, not doing that. Option two was like, oh, they have an uh, off-shelf product, moderately expensive, but just user-friendly, which I like, of course. And the third cost was like, you know, medical grade $10,000 cost plus. I probably couldn't expense report that, it's probably too much money, and uh, I don't have a medical degree in this background, so probably not. So I went with the second choice, this emotive thing going on. And so I was like, okay, I'll buy this thing. So I went on to their website and I priced out their shopping cart, and they're like, oh wait, by buying this EEG, you also need this receiver, and Oh, you can't read anything unless you subscribe to our software, so you spend another monthly cost. So it's like, wow, I'm being already scammed so much. It's like, what, three, 360 for the reader and the sensor, and then the software was like 150 bucks a month for like 250 readings, so it's like, I was like, what a scam, right? 
But I bought the thing and I was like, screw it, I bought it, right? 600 bucks, don't care. And it came in the mail, there it is in the screens, right? In this like plasticky thing, the ends of this tips are the sensors that you poked into your head and does some nice uh, readings. It came with this uh, wacky charging cable to scan me more. It's a USB to three and a half mil jack. So like, <laughs> so like obviously I can't Amazon buy this if I lose this. And I, of course I could probably like splice one together, but like, come on, really? I gotta spend more money to buy a replacement charging cable? No, the $60 thing was this receiver, right? <laughs> so what happened was, so I just spent 60 bucks to buy a Bluetooth receiver, and I was like, wait, I could spend two bucks on Amazon to buy a cheaper one. So, more scam, but I don't care. Sorry, Emotive, you made me uh, quite depressed in my wallet. So. So, we talked about measuring brain waves and how we could at least buy something to do that, but we still haven't touched on the impairment values of it. So, how can we measure how impaired a user is? Because if we're generating our own data set, we also need to be able to take into account how inebriated a person is in addition to the brain waves that we're collecting from them. Otherwise, we have no quantifiable evidence of how drunk they were. So, in order to do this, we could either conduct our own field sobriety test, but we're not trained in that, so we can't guarantee that the results will be accurate or legitimate. Um, so we have something a little bit more quantifiable, so a breathalyzer. So it'll cost still some more money, which seems to be an issue with us. Um, but it's easy because you just blow into a tube into the device and it gives you digital output of the blood alcohol content, BAC, for that user. So just as a little bit of recap of BAC values, uh, 0.08 is what you can blow before uh, getting arrested for driving. Um, so up to 0 0.08, 0 0.25 and above, you have loss of consciousness, so. <laughs> Sounds like you're gonna have a good time with that. Um, and then 0 0.40 and above is not that great of a situation, death, it, let's, let's avoid that. So we wanna be safe when conducting these experiments so we don't want to get too insanely high because that's dangerous and reckless. So how do we do this? We, let's buy one. So we didn't wanna get scammed anymore because gosh, we're spending so much money to have that device and to use the device. So we go on Amazon, we found a breathalyzer for $25, good enough for us. So, main point of this one, it was cheap, um, which is good for us. So, the biggest thing is, okay, so I spent all this money for my wallet, right, and I'm like, all right, now I got my pieces. You know, what kind of experiments do I wanna do? How do I conduct this research? And of course, I gotta answer those uh, five W's and H, and of course, the most important, how much, right, and how long. So, with that, I set up a nice uh, framework for experiments. Basically, I take a subject, I starve them to death for like eight hours straight. Fasting, right? Because we don't want any uh, impairments to themselves for the research conducting. So I make sure they're squeaky clean from anything, right? I measure their brain for about five times, make sure they look uh, positive and they're like good to go. That's my baseline. And then once I measure them, I give them a shot. Yeah, shots all day, right? And then once the first shot, we wait 15 minutes just to make your body kind of like, you know, adjust to the thing going on here. And uh, do some more readings, you know, BAC and EEG readings. And then I wait another 15 minutes and uh, more shots. Now, of course, uh, this cycle uh, does like a rinse repeat until the guy does like a mercy call or uh, I think they're like done, done, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, kind of rough. So then the next question is, okay, what alcohol? Because, you know, we all have an idea going on. So I did a lot of thinking. I was like, you know, I could go like shine, but like majority will not do that, That's right? And beer's a little too weak going on. And I did look at a classic thing going on, fireball. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> so, 
So Fireball is like, you know, not that strong. I'm just, I guess it's strong depending on the person, right? Tastes like cinnamon for those who don't know what it is, right? It's kind of enjoyable depending on the person. Uh, it's really cheap in large quantity, especially when I go to the store and I'm like, yo, I need a box of this stuff. And the guy's like, yeah, I got you, no problem. But the you know, downside is like it makes everything sticky if you like spill it everywhere, so that's like too, uh, too sweet. Okay. My test environment. <laughs> a lot of shots, right? So the biggest thing was like, usually when I do research, I gotta make sure I can do it by myself to make sure that things work well. So uh, yeah, I uh, tested this on myself to see how that works. So we're gonna talk about that. <laughs> So uh, in test zero, so I'm you know starving. I spent all day coding in C, hungry, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll test this myself right now. So this is my brain in like a nice uh, sober state, right? A lot of lines, very complex to read. I got it easy for you guys. I split it up into five small line graphs going on. Each channel on my EEG is a representation of like some cognitive skill going on, whether it's your attention span, verbal memory skills, like slurring words, right? My uh, repressed emotional skills of some sort and uh, judgment. So in my first test, BAC is zero because, you know, no shots, I'm just hungry, right? And then of course, the first thing I want to do is uh, take a shot as my uh, hunger continues. So shot one, BAC 0 0.04. So automatically I was like, whoa, my brain activity smoothed out. Notice, zero, one. Alcohol definitely, definitely makes my brain very calm going on. <laughs> so going forward, shot two. Now I'm at 0 0.5, or 0 0.05, I'm sorry. Not 0 0.5, I'll be dead right now. So definitely going on the graphs, my attention span definitely starts dropping a lot. Motion memory starts increasing. Of course, my verbal skills are dwindling slowly. You get the idea. Shot three. Now I'm at 0 0.09, and uh, I can't drive a car anymore according to this uh, lovely country's legal limits. And, but all my skills are definitely being more impaired as I go forward. Shot four. BAC is now at 0 0.11. All my brainwave activities are going all over the board. There was a lot of changes I noticed, definitely in my verbal skills going on. I already have an accent, but it got even worse, right? So shot five, BAC's at 0 0.17. So I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm feeling this thing pretty well right now. And uh, the big key thing I noticed in this part was that my emotional memory was uh, spiking a lot. So I guess a lot of repressed memories were coming out for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so shot six, I'm at zero two. So I was really feeling this thing. It, it was quite strong, right? Uh, my activities spiked everywhere. Tension spin dropped off the charts. Verbal skills not existing. I wanted to go to bed pretty much at this point, but collected this data. <laughs> so at the end, to make sure you got some visuals, the aftermath. All, you know, everything's empty. Got a 0 0.2 with proof right there in the picture. Went to bed next morning and woke up and I was like, it smells like the Christmas tree shop. Please turn that off. I guess so. I think it died. Hello. Hello. Ha. Ah. Right, I guess this uh, hand mic died, whatever. So the aftermath, it was a pretty rough night, let's go with that too much, but it was pretty fun. All right, so now that we have data, what can we do with it? So we can determine if the user is influenced or not, trying to use solely brain waves, or what we can do is try to identify a specific user. But we're not brain wave experts as much as you think we are at this point. 
So instead, let's make a computer do all the work. It's hard to program per channel, and we're only using five, but once you get up to like 40, 100 channel, that's way too ridiculous to program for each individual data point. So let's use machine learning. But first, an example. If I was drunk, how would you interpret me being drunk? Am I slurring my words? Can I do any field sobriety tests? Am I shaking it off a T-Swift? Um, <laughs> how, how do you figure out if I'm drunk? And do those mean that I am drunk or not? So there's a lot of data points to consider. All of these could be a factor, but some of them may not be. So all we can do is take an educated guess based on previous data, which is leading me into how to use machine learning. So interpret all of these checks of like, yes, I'm singing T-Swift, yes, I'm passed out on the floor. Interpret those as each individual sample in the brainwave data. We have many, many samples of over time. We have many samples over a lot of time, and we just need to interpret all of these as flags for it. So machine learning is taking um, given examples, so brainwave data, and labels, am I drunk or not, or who am I, and translating between the level of impairment. So I use four different machine learning models, uh, K-nearest neighbor and support vector machines, which are for baseline stuff. Tommy said no math, so if you want to talk math, come talk to me afterwards. Um, and neural networks have shown a lot of uh, promise for recent applications, especially like auto, uh, autonomous vehicles and stuff, so neural networks are amazing and we use them. So how do we train this model? So we take in brainwave data, which Tommy has provided, um, and we can then input that into the machine learning model. It makes a prediction based on values already inside of it and based on the label that we give it, such as how drunk I am or who I am. Um, I can then put that value back in. It adjusts the model in order to generalize to more and more data samples. So the more data that we put into it, the more accurate our model should be. So we do this over time, and eventually we get a model that can read brainwave data and identify a specific user, which is pretty freaking awesome. So after we train that model, all we do is put in an unforeseen brainwave sample, so any random sample from the users that we're collecting from, put it into the model, and with a certain degree of accuracy, we'll be able to say this is our specific person. So, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, we're wrapping up for now. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about so, it. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Okay. I take back everything I said. Okay. All right. All right. So at the end, is this a viable solution? Yeah, it's definitely viable. Are we uh, accurate? Not so much, but it's still a work in progress. So after like our like my painful experience and like a lot of testing, we're only like thirty three percent accurate in like finding people, I guess. But the thing was the the current leading market solutions is only twenty two percent accurate. So we're one up on them and hi Berkeley, I'm sorry. <laughs> so So like I said, it's a work in progress. I need more people, I need more data, I need more yeah. drinks. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, so questions with negative time. No okay, so last things to say because I'm from Grimm. Check out our booth, right? Pretty cool car thing. Follow Grimm. I'm gonna do a code release in the future with some more follow-up work, not me testing myself, of course. And uh, thanks. thanks guys. And of course, yeah. same Sorry about the time. Yes.